This is Rating Descending. Where we watch IMDb's worst 250 movies so you don't have to. I'm Michelle St. Clair. I'm Abigail Ward. And this week we watched The Next Karate Kid. Mr. Miyagi is back and he takes a new pupil under his wing. A troubled adolescent girl. Let's watch. Oh, Christ. <laughs> Actually, I know you've got lots of stuff to talk. On the sly, I just got my blood tests back for like the latest bullshit that's been going on with my body. Oh yeah, and my ANA is gone again, which is a good sign. That's but it's great. still like they're still like, well, it's gone for now, but you need to see a rheumatologist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. So it's like good news, but like caked between bad news. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a. It's it's a shit sandwich. I was about to say I was making I was about, I was gonna make a different analogy, but it, that's a classic shit sandwich. Classic shitty shit shit shitto. Classic shitto. Classic just shitting on the floor, man. You know when you go to the chicken shack and you get one shitto and a deep fried Mars bar. What the fuck? And then you hit the waves. What the fuck does this mean? Before you gaslight your girlfriend. <laughs> Puberty blues. It's, it's, I, I didn't watch that. Does that happen? They take a shit in the shop and then they gaslight their girlfriend. <laughs> Yeah, they, they they lay a massive turd in the chicken shop before they turn around and hit their girlfriend over the face and say, I did it because I love you. And they're like, you're right. Let me get you a chico roll and let's all brush it over until my mom walks out on my dad because he had a shag with the neighbor in our van. Wow. I That's don't... puberty blues, man. Uh, so, I mean, a, a recurring th- theme of the last few months of the podcast has been that I've been overworking myself on this feature whilst also doing everything else in my life. Uh, we, the very vague, mysterious feature that you're not really allowed to mention or talk about. So yeah. you, you speak about it in riddles. Could I read my contract to find, am I allowed to talk about it? Probably. Uh, have I done that in any time since mentioning it? No, I haven't. Um, no, it's fine. I really like that we start every single podcast session with you being like, answer me these riddles three. <laughs> and then it's all vaguely <laughs> related. Whoa. So I'm like, Michelle, please. Oh, censor it. (laughs) (laughs) Censor it. But yeah, uh, but the exciting news is like, as of the time of the record, I have two days left. By the time this comes out, I will be finished with the feature. Finally, I will have... How how long has it been? Like three months on the feature? Um, I get, I mean, time really has lost all meaning. I think it's been like... 20 weeks is the thing because it was initially oh, it was, so you're like one of those mums where you've just had a baby and instead of saying three months you're like <laughs> yeah. oh she's 20 weeks old um yeah i'm a thousand and forty four weeks old you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> she came out with blue eyes but they're slowly fading to green and she was originally <laughs> called camberly but now she's ebb but yeah because initially it was for 10 weeks after i just helped out for three days and then that got like almost doubled instantly when they were like, oh, we're not going to get this done. Like, I don't know why anyone thought that you were going to be done in 10 weeks, baby. You're going to stay around until you die. Which like from a... Did that land- guy work in like HR or something? Was he a people and culture person? <laughs> That's probably the, the post coordinator who is being very nice, <laughs> but she's like, you're not getting away from here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you think you're going to go home tonight on time to it's your so, loving partner for dinner? It's so dinner? weird because I, I actually, again. I didn't see her in the, the edit suite. I saw her, like, when I went outside, I was parked just on the other side of the crossroads. She just, like, appeared. It was so mm, strange. At midnight? Was it yeah. midnight at the time? Yeah, yeah. And she was playing this fiddle. And I was like, that's kind of cool. I didn't know you played the fiddle. And she handed me a contract yeah. saying, you're not getting out of this place here. Just sign in blood. And I'm like, that sounds unhygienic. And we're in a pandemic. I would have thought you knew better. Uh, so I just used pen. So it's fine. Oh, you didn't let her peer pressure you. I would check if that contract is still valid if it's bloodless. Because mm. you might have a loophole here. Oh, well, I mean, I've been paid. So at this point, I don't care. <laughs> nice. But it's been such an incredible thing. I mean, like, I've worked on features before, but, like, not even close to anything of this scale. Like, this this, this is a fully funded movie with, like, $10 million and actual Hollywood stars in it. <laughs> yeah. Just working as assistant editor. A job that despite working as an editor for like six years, I've literally never done before because I skipped it. Yeah. And now... But it's huge. It's yeah. a huge experience. It's um, massive. And it's really exciting. Well, also, let me just like, for all the filmmakers out there, 
Let me give you two completely contradictory pieces of advice. Uh, one, any if I've learned anything, it's that you can really learn on the job and make it up as you're going along, because as long as someone thinks you know what you're doing and you have enough time to figure it out before the thing is due, you actually can just do the job. And then the other side of yeah. it is your job is going to be a lot more stressful if you don't understand fundamental components of it. It's 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 a two-sided <laughs> coin because yeah. I honestly believe in faking it until you make it. And there's a, especially in the film industry, like this sounds awful and I'm probably just selling myself down the river here, but I honestly think, you know, bluff it till you muff it. Um, you know, just um, fake it bluff till it you till make you it. Bluff it till you muff it? Yeah, have you not heard that term before? That's well, I've pretty heard homophobic. Make it up till you shake it up. Oh, that's a good one. Actually, that's that's not bad. Uh, that just came off the noggin, off the dome. Lie till you die. You Lie know, till you die also... has a very different vibe to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other side of the coin I was going to get to. No, I definitely believe in bluffing your way into certain positions if you feel like you're actually capable and competent because a lot of the mm. time a lot of systems fuck you in the ass where they're like we need you to have experience but we're never going to hire you if you don't have experience yeah and like you're not you're not going to be able to get experience because we're not going to hire you because you need experience and um i think that like you have definitely throughout your life been a great testament to the fact that faking it till you make it really works and i feel like you've been because yeah. you're a you're very like you're fucking like 26 and you're working as a assistant editor on a very like for a very acclaimed Australian director, yeah, um, that's huge. Like you, you are defeating the median age of success in editing, and it's because you've you've got hustle and grind, but you've also kind of faked it till you made it. And good on you. And I also want it to be known. I mean, I feel like anyone who's listened to more than one episode of this podcast can probably implicitly understand this. I'm not a confident person. So it's not like I just wa walked into the room going, I know everything. It's more a case of they thought I knew everything and I didn't deny it. And then it, and then I just kind of tried to figure it out. I, I, well, like, I think that like, you, you, you're right. You're not necessarily, you don't, you don't, you can be a confident person. I think that sometimes your attitude or like the way that you speak to people or talk about yourself isn't confident, but you're very good at showing your technical knowledge and yeah. like things that you've remembered and things that you know you can do. Like there's different kinds of confidence. So I think you came into it being like, you might have seemed anxious or nervous, but you told them all the right things that they needed to hear. And don't get me wrong, like you have the chops and the skills behind you. I'm not saying like, Michelle, you lied to success. <laughs> you had the skill and you got your foot into the door in a very tough industry. Mad respect. It, it's kind of like the thing that I always use, I always say to describe what it feels like transitioning, which is, it, it is scary, but it's also scary to not do it. So if they're both scary, do the scary one where something happens. <laughs> one is like a short-term scary. One is a long-term scary. Because if you don't yeah. do it, you'll wake up in a year's time being like, what the fuck did I do, man? Yeah, I feel terrified every day. But things are happening. And so maybe yeah. when I'm 40, they'll be less scary. <laughs> yeah. Proud of you, Michelle. You're literally a fucking... You are a young fucking female trans editor that has made it in the Australian film industry and is yeah. currently working for one of the best Australian directors. That's enormous. Icon legend. Well, let me Skinny tell you. Skinny legend. <laughs> oh, wow. Because we've had three lockdowns during post-production. Uh, it has felt anticlimactic in some ways, but... <laughs> I graduated my master's in lockdown. Talk about anticlimactic. <sighs> it just feels weird that it's three different lockdowns. And for yeah. what feels like a much shorter thing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of buck wild things that feel somewhat anticlimactic, uh, this week we watched The Next Karate Kid. And I want to lead off with one thing in particular because it's all I could think of while watching this. If I saw this when I was a little kid, especially if I was like 10 to 12, I would have been obsessed with this movie. <laughs> Holy shit. Like watching it, I'm like this is every single thing that I wanted when I was a little girl. Every part of it. I have to say like we've obviously watched some doozies. This was not the worst that we've watched at all. If anything, no. like I was kind of shocked it was on this list because I was like, this isn't that bad. Like this is, it's got bad performances and it's cringy and it's the end of a franchise that shouldn't have necessarily continued past the first one as is most franchises. But it wasn't bad enough to warrant being lower than say Kangaroo Jack. Oh yeah, list. like... The amount of things this is lower than is wild. Yeah. <laughs> so... This was lower than the human centipede. This was lower yeah. than 
fucking this was lower than zoom <laughs> like i don't understand that on what planet is this a worse watching experience than zoolander 2 because <laughs> it has some charming things it has a young hillary swank it's got what's the main what's the name of the guy that plays mr miyagi pat Morita. amazing every time stunning performance yeah. like very nuanced it actually is Genuinely and like, there's a reason nuanced. he won a fucking oscar for it in yeah. the first karate kid but um, it's also like a young woman learning karate. It's exciting and like engaging. But it just so happens that the dialogue is terrible, the plot is nonsense, and the performances are shit. So, but like I understand, I understand intellectually that the di- I mean the dialogue is easily the worst part, and I understand intellectually that the pacing is bad as well. But it's just like this is why I didn't watch the rest of the Karate Kid ones. Like for one, I didn't have time, but also I was like. I have no attachment to Karate Kid, so I'm not going to see this as some weird late sequel perversion that is changing the formula or overdoing the formula. So to me, this is just a very pleasant movie. (laughs) Well, I so I didn't have that much of an attachment to the Karate Kid, but I rewatched it in like 2019. I think I watched it as a kid and then I watched it in 2019. Actually, I was on a trip to Melbourne at the time and I picked up a cop, like a DVD of it while I was here, went back to Sydney, watched it again. And I was like, wow, this wasn't as good as I remembered it being. Or like, <laughs> it's not as good a film as the cult status of it would suggest. Like, yeah. just because it's often cited as like a great coming of age action film. And like, it's really famous for that end sequence of him defeating the villain and Mr. Miyagi nodding and it just ending like that. But I watched it and I was like, kind of shit like not great (laughs) but it it, i can see why people love it because it's got great performances and it's very like he's a young kid that has to defeat his villains even though it's shit you're watching you're watching it very engaged and you really you really want him to win the lead's name in it is daniel daniel larusso daniel larusso played by ralph macchio daniel larusso was like a great lead to watch and i can see why a lot of young men in the 80s were like yeah fuck yeah karate kid man wax on wax off but that's what i mean right like this like Hilary Swank easily gives an equal performance to Pat Morita for me in this. Although there's a couple of lines that she flubs, like a couple. I I think she the I I mean I can think of one off the top of my head, and I feel like I don't know if there's a line that she flubs that anyone else could possibly deliver well. <laughs> <laughs> this um, is true. I feel like if your script is set up, that's like it's geared against you. There isn't much mm. wiggle room. But there was a couple of like. She did well with some lines and some other lines. I was like, that was heinously cringy. But but what I was going to say is that like any fucking time I saw a movie as a young trans woman who didn't know, like a young girl who was even moderately tall with that hair, which is basically my hair now, I, I just was obsessed with it. I really loved every entry in the Halloween Town franchise, which was a Disney Channel original series of movies, which has a similar a, a protagonist with a similar haircut and height. Especially because, of course, like twelve to fourteen year old girls tend to be taller than twelve to fourteen year old boys. Yeah. And just like watching it, I'm like, it's a cool young girl who was everything I would have wanted to be at the at the time. Like, I would have been absolutely obsessed with this movie and I wouldn't have given a shit about the dialogue and the pacing when I was 12. I yeah. would have just kept watching it. The, the fact that we're coming at it as, like, 26-year-olds, that, like, major in film yeah. and not, like, 10-year-old kids that can watch it, like, stunned and awestruck. I understand. But, like, coming at it as a 26-year-old, I'm like, what the fuck, man? It's not that you're wrong. It's just that I feel like you're criticizing 12-year-old me and it's a little bit transphobic. Yeah, well, I'm just saying that, like, I mean, yeah, I am. I'm criticizing 12 year old you. I think you should grow up. I think you should get a life. I think that you're a little loser and I'm going to give you a wedgie. All right? (laughs) Why don't you go and give your boyfriend cooties, okay? (laughs) If this doesn't summarize the Abigail-Michelle dynamic, I don't know what does. (laughs) Oh, you mean just me bullying you? (laughs) (laughs) But but sweetly, right? Right? Lovingly. Right? It's for your it's for your own good, which is sweet. <laughs> for my own good. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Fuck this. Someone's gonna humble you. What? <laughs> I'm Michelle. I work for one of the best directors in Australia. I'm an, an icon, a legend. <laughs> that's what you say. That's, yeah, right? that's that's actually how I wake <laughs> up every morning. 
<laughs> I'm Michelle, and I work for one of the best directors in Australia. I'm an icon and a legend. It's not like I yeah. said that to you just 10 minutes ago. It's just you're a fucking narcissist is what I'm saying. This is actually, I'm really glad that it coincided with this episode because this is an intervention. All yeah, right? sure. Brooke's here. Your mom's here. Your dad's here. My mom's your here. Your second grade Aww. teacher's here. Your dog's My. here. Why is my why don't bring any of my teachers from primary or high school here, please? I don't want to see any of them. Your boss is here. <laughs> oh, that's your colleagues fine. here. Your ex is here. Your, oh, which your, one? Your... <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all worried because you're honestly a bit of a bitch. That's why you're worried. What have you got to say for yourself? I've been so sad for so much of the year, and the worry is that I'm actually a bitch. <laughs> Yes, you're a narcissist. What have you got to oh, say for yourself? Excuse me while I go drive into a river for attention. Should we take that seriously, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just get into the overview, all right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, some key details. Uh, uh-huh. It was released in 1994, the year I was born, continuing my personal uh, connection with this movie. Uh, it was directed by Christopher Kane who is one of those people who has directed a fuck ton of movies that just, for the most part, we don't care about and we don't particularly care about him. But notably, he directed Six and Main and Young Guns, which are some of his more popular ones. Fantastic. Obviously, this was starring Hilary Swank, Pat Morita. Michael Ironside played the villain, who real character actor of bad guys. Mm-hmm. It had a budget of $12 million and it made $15 million. And boy, that's am I going to come shit. back to that. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, bad. Yeah, that's not great. <laughs> For Karate Kid especially, that's really not good. That's really worry. That's really worrisome. They made $2 million. Yeah. That just went to distribution, didn't it? No, yeah, absolutely. There's no way they made... I mean, there's a reason that there wasn't really more Karate Kids for a long time. ripper Um. Now let me get into the just... The normal overview. I really fucking struggled with this because there's just so much going on. Julie Pierce, a teen girl dealing with anger issues after her parents' death, has two new people into her life. One, a new boy at school named Eric who is trying to join the security fraternity Alpha Elite led by teacher Colonel Duggan. Or Duggan. Which is so bizarre. What the fuck is that? Oh, yeah, we gotta unpack that's, that. That's that's a non-existent it. thing. Oh, okay. Um and discovers that Julie is nursing an injured hawk back to health on the school's roof. <laughs> We've also got to talk about that. <laughs> We've got to talk about every part of this movie. <laughs> the other is Mr. Miyagi, an old World War II friend of Julie's deceased grandfather who reconnects with her grandmother, Louise, at a commendation ceremony for interred Japanese Americans. Mr. Miyagi agrees to take care of Julie while Louisa takes a trip to LA to relax. When Julie avoids a car accident through use of the tiger position, she confesses to Miyagi that her father once taught her karate, and he in turn confesses that he taught her grandfather karate in the first place. They reach an agreement where Miyagi will teach Julie karate in return for Julie catching up on her schoolwork. But after a setup from Alpha Elite gets her suspended, they take a trip to a Buddhist monastery so that Miyagi can try to get through to Julie's anger and teach her karate. On the way home from the school prom, Julie and Eric, who went together, are ambushed by Alpha Elite, and Eric takes off to the docks to confront them. Julie and Miyagi head off to save him and find Duggan and Alpha Elite close to beating him to death. Julie challenges the members to a duel, which she wins. An unsatisfied Duggan then challenges Miyagi himself, who easily dispatches the brood, causing the members to lose faith in his leadership. Miyagi teaches Julie the final lesson, that you should avoid fighting if you can, but if you must fight, win. Which I assume is also in Karate Kid 1. I don't think it was. Like, I don't remember him saying that in the first Karate Kid. Maybe oh. that's Mr. Miyagi's saying, but I just thought that was a new, like, a new lesson that they were trying to push into this next Karate Kid. A new theme. <laughs> a new theme. It makes so much, it's so touching, isn't it? Yeah. So even though I enjoy this movie as a whole, you can tell from that overview, there's some pretty glaring things in there that are fucking buck wild. Holy I've- shit. <laughs> I will say it's like a nice, it's a welcome change from our usual action, like bad action film where it's almost Mm. impossible to follow the plot and our overviews are too long because we're trying to explain too many convoluted plot lines. This one is just like, she goes away with him for two weeks to learn more karate and then they come back and she goes to the prom. Like, it's just one fucking story, man. Well, look, I mean, like my main critique of the movie, just to get it out of the way, is that like the 
first act has too many elements introduced in all the wrong way. So it's like 30 minutes before the first act turn and it's really kind of slow. But then the second act is bereft of stuff happening. Well, I don't know because she meets like Mr. She met Mr. Miyagi. I was kind of impressed. I was like, oh, wow, Miyagi and her meet quite quickly. Like, he goes to, like, that ceremony. He goes to see Louise. And then he meets Julie. And you're like, oh, shit. Like, okay, great. They've met within the first, like, five minutes. And then they nothing happens until, like, it, he, he drops her grandmother off to go to, to, like, take care of his flat while he stays in Boston to help Julie. And then nothing really happens until the midpoint where they go away together. And, like, it's in the middle of the film where they go to that two-week retreat and you're like but, fucking hell but that's what i mean like it's called the karate kid the scene where she goes can you teach me karate and he says i t- i will teach you karate if it's you the catch midpoint. up with schoolwork but that should be 20 minutes in and it comes yeah. in i checked 30 minutes in it's called oh, the it? karate kid yeah that's 30 minutes they in. don't the go away to the retreat until halfway through the film i swear well, to god because there's a lot that between the scene i just described yeah. and them going to the which is just absolutely monster. strange because you would think that he would start training her and take her away well, properly I, like he I tries think, yeah but she, she's not very receptive to it it's just it takes fucking ages but the, yeah the, the the agreement to start learning karate needs to come way sooner which is yeah. really quite frustrating but, yeah 100 percent. okay so we gotta unpack the the weird weird fascist cult at the school run by a teacher alpha Elite. run by dugan i think his name is yeah like well it's, it's spelt duggan which is why i got confused but yeah his, they all call him dugan colonel dugan yeah. and it's never and he's like specified whether he's a real colonel he's so evil he's like beating yeah. kids up and like just like I, at the end of the film it's revealed that like he's like finish him off to like the yeah. guy that that he's fighting like he, he gets his young student to fight the lead the guy that hillary swank is falling slowly in love with and then he's like finish him off and they're like what sir no and he's like what do you think i trained you for and i was like yeah what? yeah <laughs> he trained them to kill people yeah because they're they're he's already getting students to beat each other up a really weird fucking thing to do at the docks there's fire very, because they exploded eric's car very spartan very homoerotic yeah. if you will yeah then he's beaten to death and yeah as you say he says finish him off and you're like is he gonna is he asking them to kill him? <laughs> Finish him off. Very Spartan. Very homoerotic, if you will. Am I right? Up top. Up top. Yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about gay right, sex. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about gay sex. Gay sex. My favorite yep. kind. I just wasn't expecting while watching The Karate Kid to watch a teacher order a student to murder another student. Like, that's not in the fucking school handbook. He's that was also- a huge huge development huge change yeah. like I, st- I was cooking dinner as i was watching the film and i had to put my knife down and just watch it for- i was like what <laughs> yeah because <laughs> they've been pretty like they're introduced up top and it's suddenly like this guy brooding in the halls and then we see three muscly teens all wearing a black polo that has a logo on it and jeans and you're like who the fuck is this I only knew they were a security fraternity because of the Wikipedia overview. I did yeah. not get that from the text of the movie. Well, I just had well, no idea the what they were. There's the bit where Hillary Swank, like Julie and what's the name of the guy that is the lead, like her friend? Is his name Michael? Eric. So close, you know. <laughs> There's a bit where he's like showing her to like, they sit on the top of this train together because that's where he yeah. likes to, you know, go and hang out and get a bit of fresh, like fresh air and chill. And he specifies, he says like, uh, she asks him like what they're doing. And he says, with security but he doesn't really divulge anything more than that and she's like so you're a yeah. bouncer and he's like we're security and i'm like but what are they securing what is this fraternity why is it so elite and why are people part of it for a pre-9-11 america pretty prescient you know like <laughs> um michelle we just passed the 20th year anniversary of 9-11 so have a bit of respect yeah, so it's the perfect time to address the uh, over-militarization of the country that happened in the wake of 9-11. And this came out in 1994, so pretty fucking prescient. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by what I said. <laughs> but yeah, the, you, you're right. They're sitting on top of a train. And yeah, I, I stand by my statement. He is a manic pixie dream boy. There's a time where she's like trying to talk to him. Like, are you going to check on the hawk? And he's like walking across the top of the train being like, huh. yeah. I don't know if I'm in an agreeing sort of mood today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, this is just a manic pixie dream girl, but given to this like blonde haired hunk boy. I'm glad that you brought up the hawk because why? <laughs> I was watching the whole film being like, yeah, but why is there a hawk? Like, why is 
Who why, who put the hawk in as a storyline? Well, that's what I mean when I say, like, the first act is overstuffed. The hawk feels so extraneous. It's such an unnecessary... It's cool, but it's, like, when you also have a fascist cult at the school and she's learning karate because from a guy that her grandfather learnt from, like, there's already a lot going on. To add in an and- injured hawk and a manic pixie dream boy is just a lot. And it's not even like the hawk wasn't set up as being her being like, oh, yeah, I take care of a hawk sometimes. The hawk felt like it was going to be a central plot line because she's devoted to it. It's the reason that she and Eric become friends because he Mm. wants to help her like with the hawk while she's away. I was like, surely the hawk is a larger part of the story. But around like after the middle when she's on that retreat, the two week retreat to learn Kung Fu, Kung Fu, karate. Whoa. She comes, that's um, cancel me now. When she comes back from that retreat, she literally, they set the hawk free and then it comes back to her. And Miyagi says something very beautiful about the fact that the hawk being in its cage for so long doesn't know what to do in the outside world. And then they set it free again. And I was like, okay. Is the Hulk going to come back, like, hulked up and then beat the shit out of the final boss with them? Like, is that... What? <laughs> I didn't what? genuinely think that was going to happen, but I was like, why yeah, is the I'll... Hulk leaving? Like, at this point, why is the Hulk going? A uh, Hulk is going to fight fascists. No, Hawks are their symbol, man. <laughs> <laughs> at least That's it's not why a she fucking had to let it go. eagle, am I right? Oh, whoa. Hey. Uh, hey. What she, what she should have had was the, the symbol of good good old-fashioned leftism a badger a ferret a mule a jack a i think you'll find it's a snowflake uh, oh. <laughs> let me get back I mean, to my reddit forums now i mean i know in reality it's a rose but that's not an animal is it actually a rose yeah what? a rose is often used as an international symbol in particular of social democracy but often of social socialism as well yeah i didn't know that at all yeah the the hawk because the, the i mean the hawk does play into the midpoint because she goes to look after the hawk and they okay we got to talk about this so she goes back to the school at night to look after the hawk and then as she's there she turns her in a corner and then a torch turns on and it's the main guy from alpha elite who is at this point repeatedly made incredibly uncomfortable sexual advances on her yeah really awful um just going, hey, and then there's she tries to run, and then there's more hey. men. Uh, hey, how you going? What's hey, up? Hey, man. Hey. But then there's more muscly men surrounding her, and I'm like, this children's movie didn't need to feel so sexually violent. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't ever quite get there, which is good because it's a children's movie. But, like... I don't know. I have a real problem with the fact that in a lot... I mean, you've ranted about a similar thing before. In a lot of film, when it's violence against men, it's just violence. And when it's violence against women, it's almost always exclusively always. sexual violence. Always. And it, it kind of, like, even if it's always portrayed as a bad thing, like, a lot of lefty things go like, oh, she beats sexual violence. That's a cool, empowering narrative. But it's not, because it kind of teaches you that the only way to be violent against women is to be sexually violent. Yeah. But that's actually a very specific extra form of violence that is maybe a bad thing to embed in the brains of young men. I totally, yeah. I I don't mind watching women ha- opposing violence. I really mm. get bothered watching them having to oppose sexual violence. I don't mind if I watch them like having a fist fight with a man, but I really yeah. get upset if I'm watching a potential rape scene. It's so yeah. different and it's so disturbing in such a different way. We've watched ser- several horror movies on this list and one of the most terrifying scenes in any of them is her desperately running away from five young teenage boys who are depicted as fascists who want who have made previous sexual advances on her i'm like i'm fucking terrified for this i mean that's a huge claim because you watched (laughs) baisemore yeah i actually watched (laughs) baisemore and this was terrifying (laughs) it was really scary and it makes you that's a thing like i know it seems innocent but you're a fucking a lot of this is handled by a group of men and but when you're a woman watching this film you're sitting a bit on the edge of your seat being like am i about to watch something i really don't want to see am i about to be potentially triggered into thoughts that i really don't want to have and it's it's so easy to to have just not done that he could have just been a regular bully who wants to beat her up or whatever or, mm. or or kick her out and then she gets like an injured arm or something like it, it's yeah, so it's easy for it to not be in that 
it's all, it's bizarre that they were like, well, it'd be more normal for him to rape her than say challenge her to a fist fight. So it will make him a sexual predator. Yeah, it's like that, is that really the world we're living in where it is more normal to get raped by men than beaten up? Yeah, it is. Like it honestly that, is. Well, because then there's also when they go to the uh, the petrol station, that that it's it's such an incongruous scene in the movie because they just go to a petrol station and then Miyagi talks down a dog from being aggressive, which really upsets the three men at the petrol station, who then go out to confront him. And then when Julie tries to leave, they're like, "You're not leaving until we say so," and then do this weird, creepy grin at her. And I'm like, "Why put this in the scene? Why do yeah. this? Don't yeah, do 100%. this." This is. It's also. This is the Karate Kid. I don't want to watch yeah. that sexual assault. I don't want implications about the lead character getting raped. Did fucking Daniel De La Russo have to La Russo have to put up with this shit? Like, was Daniel ever threatened sexually? No, he's a young man. It's always like this fucking kind of harmless physical threat that he has yeah. but he is never threatened sexually and being threatened sexually is so much more just it's so much more bothersome to watch as a woman you are yeah. you're making half of your viewership feel alienated although yeah. i can't say that i mean like it's the karate kid the next karate kid is a female lead it was written for young women and you're making yeah. young women feel un easy watching the film that you targeted towards them why and and i stand by the fact that i overall enjoyed this movie but i i'm telling you right now i would have enjoyed it a lot more if that what just wasn't a part of it because it, it just so didn't need to be the bit that i really enjoyed about this film on the yes. opposite of what we're talking about is when she's at that two-week retreat learning karate actually no, wait, hang on before i start let me just talk okay. about my favorite moment in the entire film my favorite okay. favorite moment she and Miyagi have not gotten along yet. They're not happy. Mm -hmm. They're not They're not living together quaintly. Mm -hmm. But th there's this bit where they have a fight where he's basically walked in on her and she's having this like absolute freak out at him. He's asked her to do her homework and she's like, I'll do it later. And then they yeah. have this big fight through the house and she tries to storm out. And he's saying like, like, I want you to come back. I want you to do your homework. And she says, why would I ever listen to you? You don't even speak English. And then she walks across the road and a pizza car almost hits her. And that's yeah. when she does her slow motion jump into the air and she tiger crouches over the car. And yeah. Miyagi's like, how did you do that? The whole sequence of them fighting about this inane homework and then her yelling at him, why would I speak to you? Why would I listen to you? You don't even speak English, which I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's on. not that's great. <laughs> and then her tiger crouching over the car. It was a miraculous sequence. It was, it's I was hooked. Pure cinema. Which, pure by cinema. the way, that lands in the library of real stinker lines in this movie with what is easily the worst line in the movie towards the beginning where she and the grandmother are fighting. And then the grandmother is like, oh, stop it, Susan. And then Julie turns around and is like, Susan is the name of my mother. And they're, uh, and my mother and father are both dead. They died in a car <laughs> crash and they're not coming <laughs> back. And I'm like, Stop. Oh my God. It really um harkens to that amazing TikTok by oh, Caitlin O'Reilly where she's like, my mom, she's dead, okay? And she's not coming back. And I know I look exactly like her, but she's dead, okay? She's not coming back. And it's just that for a minute. It, it's also particularly funny if niche because she is explicitly referenced as her paternal grandmother. So I don't know why she would by default call her by her mom's name. Yeah. Rather, like, that's her dad's mom. So how, like, when... I, it's such a weird thing for her to do that. It's not like she's used to looking after a young woman called Susan. There's literally also a bit where Julie is looking at the photo of her parents and she's like, it's so uh, like, <laughs> awful that they died. Yeah. Like, it just isn't fair that my parents are dead. <laughs> like, well, but then she's like, he was wise and kind and she yeah. was beautiful. Like a pr I'm like, I've never met someone who loves their parents this much in this way. Holy shit. How, how does it feel to have been so normal? The dialogue isn't even on the nose. Like the dialogue has been inserted straight up your right nostril. It's insane. Oh yeah. Subtlety is not this movie's forte. But what I was going to say is that one of my favorite bits of the film is where she's on the two week retreat with all those, they're all monks at this like temple that she's yeah. learning karate at with Mr. Miyagi. They are specifically Zen Buddhist monks. 
And there's this bit where she puts on dreams by the cranberries and she's like yeah. dancing around to it. But then all the monks come in and she's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But then they all start dancing to it. And yeah. then like Mr. Miyagi states that like even great masters of karate, like if you can do karate, then you can dance as well. It's and it's just even this really spiritual cute scene leaders, of like never trust a spiritual yeah. leader who doesn't want to dance or have fun yeah. or something. And yeah. then when she leaves the two week retreat, they make like a little cake for her. And I'll sing mm. like happy birthday. It's just so cute. It's so sweet. It it the scene in which because there's she almost she goes to kill a cockroach at one point and the Miyagi stops her and then all the Zen monks walk away because they're offended because they don't want to kill anything. Yeah. And she doesn't get it. And then a couple scenes later, she wakes up and she's out in nature and it's like played almost purely silent and she finds a praying mantis and she looks so delighted and entranced by the the magic of nature that she takes the praying mantis to the monk to show him the this beautiful nature and she says I'm sorry for killing the, for trying to kill the cockroach and he takes the praying mantis and puts it on the leaf and I'm like this is a genuinely great scene if this was in like a 70s movie by an auteur director you would all eat it up all right just fucking <laughs> Check yeah, your own what biases. I'm saying, man, is that if this was Daniel LaRusso for his fourth installment of The Karate Kid, you'd be fucking eating it up. But as soon as it's a woman... I'm saying if Paul Thomas Anderson put that exact scene frame <laughs> for frame in his own movie, you would claim it and say, like, oh, beautiful, it's some Terrence Malick shit. Now, come on. I think that that was also a really nice... Like, Mr. Miyagi is obviously, like... um. He's he's a really like well known and beloved character, and um, is known for his depth in the first Karate Kid film because there's a lot of backstory that he tells Ralph or like Daniel when they're like having drinks together and he's like drinking mm. sake and rem like rem like reminiscing on like losing his wife and um, yeah. like going through the war. So Mr. Miyagi has a lot of incredible rich backstory, and they obviously can't they didn't do much with that in this one. Like Mr. Miyagi was a little bit flat, obviously, but they did layer in a nice storyline about the fact that he never had kids and how he, Mm. like the fact that he treats her like a daughter when it's coming up to prom, he buys her a dress and it's just really sweet. Yeah, She's like, they have this little like dance together. And I was like, this is really touching and really nice. Yeah. He cares for her like a father. (laughs) This this movie's sweet. It's nice. I liked it. (laughs) Watching Hilary Swank playing this like troubled teen that Mr. Miyagi is taking care of. Really nice. (laughs) Yeah, really it's nice. good stuff. Uh, well, on that note, uh, would you like to hear some trivia? Yes. IMDb trivia. I don't have a ton of trivia, but I do have some. Uh, and this is my... Uh, I'll start with my favorite piece of the trivia. So uh-huh. because Hilary Swank could learn the advanced flashy moves and had trouble with the beginner moves, Pat E. Johnson, the martial arts choreographer, awarded her with a pink belt a mix of the white beginner belt and red the one just under black belt oh shit why could she master the harder moves and apparently not the beginner she moves? was just really good at doing all the really like sick jumps and shit and really bad at the basic beginner that's stuff. so bizarre i don't even and know what the basic beginner do some stuff of it in the movie be. Well, I assume the beginner stuff. I mean, like, we, I assume some of the beginner stuff is just like the basic forms and movement and being able. Yeah, to look, move I don't precisely. know why I didn't feel like I could trust this film in teaching karate because I was like, <laughs> I wouldn't even know what that looked like. Like, I didn't just watch a whole film about a girl learning karate. <laughs> well, the, I mean, that goes to show you the success of the movie in that particular manner. <laughs> yeah, it just goes to show how much I have faith in this film and its accuracy, which is zero. But I love how you see pink belt and you think like, that's kind of weird. Is it just because she's at no, it's because it's specifically mixing white and red. Mm. It makes sense. That's cute. Here's another piece of trivia. Mr. Miyagi's approach to karate training is different in this movie. Although he still has Julie wash cars, wax on, wax off, in order mm-hmm. to teach her how to block punches and kicks. In the original 1984 film, Daniel used to think karate came from Buddhist temples, and Miyagi chides him. You watch too much TV. In the next Karate Kid, Miyagi actually trains Julie at a Japanese monastery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, Fuck full circle. Man. That's the, the, the background uh, arc of Mr. Miyagi. That's stunning. And then I'm going to start this last piece of trivia with uh, a question. Of the five 
associated Karate Kid movies, which do you think is the highest grossing? Oh, because Cobra Kai is a TV sh- show, not a movie, right? I wasn't including Cobra Kai, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know it's not this film because it grossed 15 million on a 13 million budget. Mm-hmm. And it, you're, you, the way that you're asking me it makes it sound like it's not going to be the first one. So I'm going to say the second Karate Kid. You're close. That is the second highest grossing. The highest grossing is actually the 2010 remake with Jaden Smith and Jackie Chan uh, for the $171 million in the box office. Holy shit. I sh- actually should have thought of that. I feel like a fucking fool. And then, yeah, Karate Kid 1 made the second most. And then Karate Kid 3 made $30 million. So it's, this is still half of the lowest grossing one, which was maybe $50 million below everything else. Like, God this is damn. the lowest box office by far. God damn. Yeah. Uh, do you want to hear some reviews? I do. Indeed, I do. Reviews! So this has 7% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average of 3.7 out of 10, and it has 4.4 on IMDb. And I'll just launch into some IMDb reviews. This first one is called Excellent Martial Arts Flick by Catherine Grace Zeh. The next Karate Kid, in my opinion, is an excellent martial arts flick. I thought that Eric, Chris Conrad, and Julie, Hilary Swank, looked good in their prom attire. To me, Ned, Michael Cavallari. Okay, wait, hang on, hang buddy. on. <laughs> okay, hang on. Hilary Swank's prom attire is this white dress that she's given by Mr. Miyagi, and it's a very sweet yeah. scene. But there's this bit where he walks in, and she's like, can you believe it? Like, I didn't think I'd look this good. And the dress is, like, too big around her breasts, and it looks bizarre. Like, she looks lovely, of course, but, like, that one shot of her standing in it, I'm like, it doesn't fit her properly. What's going on? I was just okay. like, ah. Oh. You're not wrong. It's just that I felt gender euphoria watching it. I was like, (laughs) this would have made 12-year-old me cry. It would have made 8-year-old me cry. It would have made 12-year-old me look at it confused. Um, I just want to know who in the wardrobe department did her dirty. That's all I want to (laughs) know. To me, Ned, Michael Cavalieri, was a real bully. This was because he got Julie in trouble with Principal Wilkes, Eugene Bowles. If you ask me, Colonel Duggan, Michael Ironside, was a pure asshole, but it's uh, bleeped. Uh, Sorry, was a pure A asterisk asterisk asterisk. This was a. This was because he was a very harsh man who wouldn't tolerate mistakes. Also, Michelle, you can just censor yourself because you have that power. Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, you could censor exactly what I'm saying right now. I'm going to say all kinds of bad words like poop, fart, bad, booby, butt, asshole, and even something like vagina testicles. Why would you drop so many slurs in such a short period of time? Guess you're going to have to beat them all out, baby. (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) But Abby didn't say anything close to that. (laughs) (laughs) My favorite parts were the prom and the showdown between Julie and the Alpha Elite. In conclusion, I highly recommend this smash hit to all of you who like martial arts flicks or are fans of Hillary Swank. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Uh, Here's another one. I think that this sequel has become a cult favorite. It's actually called a squeakle, but sure. Sorry, (laughs) sorry, my bad. By Or Stylist124. Originally, How is it spelled? It, is it like or as in like a paddle or like or as in like I'm in or? One word, A-W-S-T-Y-L-I-S-T. Okay. Uh, which I just assume is or stylus. Well, Maybe that's it's my Abigail initials. Ward, stylus. Yeah, I was going to say, how did you find me? <laughs> um, originally, it did not do great. But with time, it has become a favorite amongst young women. Uh, sorry, oh. against young women. The story of Julie, yet not Oregonal. Oregonal to a movie buff, <laughs> yet inspiring to first-time viewer. It has taught young... Go- Sorry, I'm having a stroke reading this. this Oregonal is getting me too much. <laughs> let, me, let me start again. I forgot how confusing this one. Oregonal is actually okay. the fifth most searched um, query on Pornhub. Um, okay. You know how you have Ori- queries on Pornhub? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let me start again. Originally, it did not do great, but with time, it has become a favorite amongst young women. The story of Julie, yet not oregonal to a movie buff, yet inspiring to first-time viewer. It has taught young girls to be strong. As to Jay, 10 out of 10. That's beautiful. And it's so true. (laughs) Oregonal is my takeaway. I just, the sentence structure, I feel, just doesn't really go anywhere. (laughs) 
And this uh, is maybe, sorry, I just reread it. This is maybe my favorite review I've ever brought up on this podcast. It's called, it's titled More Than Just a Karate Film by Bevo13678. And this was left specifically, I noted down, 29th of March, 2020. So quite recent. I'm not sure if I've ever seen this film, but I'm sure it's pretty good. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> King, legend, what if, do, can, are you able to see if that person's left other reviews on IMDb? Is that like even a possibility? Uh, let's look it up. Let's, uh, you know what? I just love the idea on multiple films being like, might have seen this, might have not. 10 out of 10. <laughs> it's, it's some bold shit to <laughs> have not seen the movie and then leave a 10 out of 10 review. Not a 7, not an 8, a 10. That's huge didn't watch it don't know how i feel about it (laughs) but i'm i think it's a it's the general consensus is 10 right definitely wins for best review ever left for sure um all right i'm trying to chase up this review so i can find the user all right i found this person's account oh my god they left a review for a particular episode of the block they they, this guy reviews the block a lot (laughs) what the fuck the block like the reality (laughs) show the block (laughs) I like the bit where the bloke got really angry and slammed the gate really hard. I like the bit where something controversial happened and one of the contestants got angry. I like the bit where one of the contestants got angry. Jesus. It's like, (laughs) I I, want to say that this is like a troll that's like just fucking around. But at the same time, like I worked at JB Hi-Fi where some people are really particular about the things that they watch and enjoy, especially reality TV. And some people just genuinely are like this. This guy left has left 3,888 reviews. Oh my God. Oh my God. Holy shit. I think this guy has reviewed everything he's ever watched and it's a lot of reality TV. Fuck. Oh, here we go. He reviewed the um the, the movie Rush, which I'm pretty sure Ron Howard directed. Okay. Um, he said great comedy action with heaps of witty jokes and car chases. Ten. This guy leaves a lot of tens. He loves. Oh it. my god, it's like almost exclusively tens. So, so, li- listeners, I'm sorry. I, I I understand that this is moving well out of our normal format and pace, but this this guy is fascinating. <laughs> He's our hero. This here's here's a review of uh, season three episode eight of Twirly Woo's More About Coming and Going. After all these years, I still loved the honking bit at the start. <laughs> but then here's a review of season three episode four of Twirly Woo's. Yeah, not but but it was actually a bit noisy for my liking. Ten out of ten. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> wow, this uh, what if I'm hey if you're out there if you ever listen to this. Uh, Bevo13678 I would actually really genuinely like to meet and talk I just have a lot of questions No judgments, just questions <laughs> But putting that god tier review aside What was your review? 5 out of 10 Straight down the middle wanna, baby You don't want to elaborate? Straight down the middle baby I think it deserves more than what INDV gave it Oh easily I think it's on par with a good year And that like I didn't have such a resonance to it as you did Probably because I didn't have her fringe like you did um, it seems like it's all made up in the haircut for you. But <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I, I draw a lot hey, of self-identity hey, from my hey, hair. All I right? can't judge. I can't judge. I only liked Stevie from the fucking Saddle Club because she was the blonde one. And Chloe was my favorite brat doll because she was the blonde one. So I get it. I I just think it deserves more than IMDb gave it. But I also kind of good conscious, consciousness give it over a five. But I did mm. enjoy it. I had a nice time watching it. I thought it was quite touching in some places. And it was also such bad dialogue. I could almost watch it again for it. So mm. I, I would happily rewatch the whole film again just so I can watch her be like, why would I listen to you? You don't even speak English. And then Tiger crouch over a pizza delivery car. Yeah. I loved it. Five out of ten. I I mean, I mentioned up top that I... Up top. Just seeing it, I was like, hey... It was the kind of movie that I'm like, man, I really needed this when I was a little girl, like especially when I was like seven or eight or something. I don't know. It had a lot of pieces in it we talked about that were really sweet and genuine. Like it's very, very clear to me that the majority of the hate against it is, oh, it's the fourth sequel. And also, oh, this is the one with a girl in it instead of a boy. Oh, that sucks. It's not as like clear cut misogyny as, as like, 
some of the vitriol against things like Captain Marvel, but that's very clearly the, the like, this is not a 4.4, it's 7% on Rotten Tomatoes, that's crazy. But in particular, it has some nuggets in it. Like, I wrote down this quote that Julie says to Louisa before Louisa says goodbye to her. Julie says, I try to talk to you, but I just get angry. Everything gets messed up and I don't know why. And on one level, that's an example of, like, bad dialogue and it's overly cheesy or whatever. But at the same time, that encapsulates exactly how I felt as a little kid, where I just felt angry all the time and I didn't understand. And it made me sad when I would actually confront the fact that I didn't understand why I was feeling that way. Yeah, I mean, being an emotional kid is on par with being a screenwriter that's out of your depth and unable to write proper dialogue. I get it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, little kids don't arti- don't necessarily articulate in any other uh, forms than directly or, I don't know, little kids are expositional. Um, they are. But all I mean to say is that I think I would have really, really enjoyed this as, as a little girl, and I want to show this to my own little girl. I'm going to give it a 6.5 out of 10. Like, it's not a great nice. movie, so it's not... You know, not as good as the other sevens I've given, like Ultraviolet or Bra One, like a fucking idiot. <laughs> but I, I'm going to give this a 6.5. Excellent, my guy. Well, that was The Next Karate Kid. Uh, if you like, you could follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at Rate Descend Pod. You could find us on TikTok at Rating Descending. Or you could email us at ratingdescending at gmail.com. Or you could follow us on our personal accounts. I am on Insta under Abigail J. Ward. Or you could find me bumming around on Twitter and Instagram at Michelle.StClair. And don't forget to drop us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really makes a difference to some podcasters in need spare a thought and a penny for us today yeah spare a penny i mean it's a penny we'll lose it but if you could spare it that would be you know what they say in for a penny in for a pound but uh that was the next karate kid what are we watching next next week we are watching look who's talking now Ooh, Ooh. i'm excited i I don't don't know anything about it uh, i used to like the the first one with uh john travolta and kirstie alley i mean i think they're in all three of them uh so i'm keen to see the abysmal third in that trilogy oh wait so we're watching the third look who's talking now Oh yeah. No no no. Oh. Look who's talking is the first one. Look who's talking now. Oh. It's look who's talking, look who's talking too, and look who's talking now. But that sounds Don't fun. That's what that's yeah. what we'll be in a week. Bad, bad.